Jesus. We're going to start here in a few uh, seconds. I'm just kind of letting some people kind of join in here. So <clears throat> and we'll start in about 20 seconds. Oops, got to change the date on that. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on simplified acquisition and micro purchases. Um, uh, don't mind the date there, I'll change it before I send you the presentation. One of the things that we always get asked, of course, is um, will you get copies of the presentation? Yes, you'll receive a copy of this PowerPoint as well as a link to the recording of the presentation. <clears throat> so, with that, let's just kind of jump into it. So a little bit about who we are. So we're the Apex Accelerator, formerly Procurement Technical Assistance Center, or PTAC, and we're administered locally by the Monterey County Business Council. And Apex Accelerators are funded through the Department of Defense, and that's what's going on since 1985. There's actually 96 uh, Apex centers across the United States, and there's seven within the state of California. And the mission of all Apex Accelerators is to promote economic growth and employment opportunities in the local markets that they serve. And we do that by facilitating uh, access to the government marketplace. And although we're federally funded, uh, that's access to federal, state, as well as the local marketplace. Uh, I mentioned uh, that there are seven accelerators in uh, California. So you can see the various color code areas. We're this teal area, Central Coast, Central Valley, in the middle of the state. So if you're in this webinar and you're from one of the other low, uh, one of the other counties, uh, please reach out to them or you can reach out to us and we'll send you the contact information for our colleagues at one of the other Apex Accelerators. <clears throat> Let me, hold on. Excuse me a second. Let me get a sip of water. So these are the basic services that Apex Accelerators provide. So first and foremost, it's confidential one-on-one -on -one counseling. We want to learn about, about your business, what you've done in the past, what you're doing now, and then your goals for government contracting. So then we can basically develop kind of a, a plan of how we are going to proceed. Uh, we, we do that basically in the beginning with pre-award assistance. We help teach you how to go out and find opportunities where they're at, et cetera. Uh, we then uh, help you understand and review the uh, notices that are, are the posted. They go by different names. That's why I kind of stumbled a little bit there, but uh, help you understand what you're looking at and then talk to you about maybe uh, the importance of capability statements was a great uh, promotional piece that's in a format that the government likes to see. Post award assistance, uh, conflicts arise. Uh, so we kind of help coach you about that, talk to you about debriefs, what those are, and then uh, protests, you know, and to talk to you a little bit about whether it really makes sense for you to do that or not. Outreach events, we'll, we're out and about in the community, basically talking to people about who we are, the services we provide. And then, of course, Part of those outreach events, kind of like today, we're typically there uh, also providing some type of training. Um, bid match is a, a service that we provide where we basically work with you, create a profile of your business, upload it into um, a system that basically goes out and searches thousands of government websites where contract opportunities are, are posted. And then any matches then are emailed directly to you. So it saves you the, the time and trouble of having to go to these different websites separately. 
and oftentimes too, I mean, it'll it'll find opportunities uh, with government uh, agencies that uh, maybe you never even considered even approaching. So it, it's a great tool. Uh, navigating certification programs. So there's a lot of certification programs out there. And we can kind of coach you on whether they make sense for your business or not, and then help you understand the, the qualifications, the supporting documents that are required, et cetera. And then um, a great thing is that there are no fees or commitments. You know, we're your tax dollars at work, so take advantage of that. Similar to us is um, the small business development centers that are throughout the United States. And with that, I'd like to introduce Sharon Mikesell, who represents the Cal Coastal SBDC. Great, thank you, Victor. Um, as Victor mentioned, I am Sharon Mikesell, the program manager at Cal Coastal Small Business Development Center. You may know us better as Cal Coastal SBDC. Um, there's around a thousand center, uh, SBDC centers nationwide. We're part of the Central California network. And Cal Coastal SBDC in particular provides small businesses in Monterey and San Benito counties with one-on-one, -on -one, no fee business advising, training, and access to comprehensive resources and information to help businesses start, grow, and succeed. Uh, what we do is we provide financial education, business plan guidance, and marketing tips that can help businesses get started with government contracts of all sizes. And we find that many of our clients get started in government contracting as subcontractors or with contracts of cities, counties, and special districts, and like with, with the topics that Victor will be talking about today. So our services complement Apex Accelerator services. So we recommend signing up for services from both of our organizations, especially since, as Victor said, there's no cost to you. And why is there no cost to you from um, our center? It's because we have the support of our partners, including the US Small Business Administration, the California Office of the Small Business Advocate, local partners that include the Monterey County Workforce Development Board, the Monterey County Business Council, the City of Salinas, and our host and small business lender, Cal Coastal Rural Development Corporation. So if you're not our client already, we certainly hope you will think about it. Visit our website at calcoastlsbdc.com, click that little green get started button. And of course, you can always follow us on social media. Um, thanks for joining us today. I'm going to throw it back over to Victor to start today's presentation. Uh, thank you, Sharon. And some of the stuff we'll be talking about today, uh, the SPDC can be very helpful with that. Uh, part of that is, you know, having a good web presence. And they've got some experts there that can really kind of help you with that. So let's just kind of jump into our presentation. So today, this is going to be our agenda. We'll talk a little bit about the definition thresholds of uh, simplified acquisitions and then micro purchases, and then talk about how, how they're used, why are they used, when they're used, and then just some basic facts about uh, procurement activity by the federal government, and then talk a little bit about, you know, which is important as to how to, how to win some of these awards that are purchased through either uh, simplified acquisition or micro purchases. <laughs> so simplified acquisition uh, is uh, basically uh, you can actually look up the entire definition and all the regulations that most of it pertains to government buyers of what they do in this FAR Part 13. But basically, uh, the, th the, the upper limit of a simplified acquisition purchase is $250,000. So typically you're seeing simplified acquisitions being used between 25,000 to up to 250,000. However, when we're uh, in the state of the disaster response, then uh, it's really uh, imperative that the government can actually use this process uh, to respond quicker. So they actually raised that threshold up to $750,000. During COVID, as an example, uh, simplified acquisition uh, fell under that $750,000 uh, threshold. Now, micro purchases basically are kind of like anything uh, $10,000 or, or less. And you can see during a disaster response, 
that it goes up to twenty five thousand dollars. And micro purchase basically is uh, purchases that government is making using basically a credit card. They call it a a government uh, purchasing card, but basically it's uh, you being able to uh, take a credit card for a purchase. And we'll kind of get more into that here in a minute. So, you know, what's, what's the purpose of, uh, you know, simplified acquisition and uh, micro purchases? Well, uh, government has learned that basically it reduces administrative costs or actually rather than going through this whole process of putting together like a, what's called a solicitation, which is a lot more work, it just reduces the administrative costs. They can just quickly go out, maybe get three different quotes, and then uh, make a purchase. Uh, it really helps to improve opportunities for small businesses. So again, it being such an easier process, there's not like a more complicated document like solicitation that we might have to educate you on as far as what does this mean? What does that mean? How do I do this? Uh, it's just much more simpler process where uh, you've got a product or service that, that the government wants. Uh, you just give them a price. If they like your price, they say, okay, we'll, we'll take it. And then it's, it's done. Uh, it, and per all that is point C here is it promotes efficiency and economy and contracting. So again, it's easier for you as the seller and it's easier for, for the buyer. <clears throat> and as you see here, and it's kind of repetitive, it's just, avoids unnecessary burdens for both the agencies and the contractors. So uh, that's that's basically the biggest thing is that there's 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 smaller purchases and it just makes it easier for everyone. So uh, so let's go in a little bit like why do buyers like uh, simplified acquisition purchases or micro purchases? Well, oftentimes, uh, they it's a way in which uh, there it's lower lower dollar values that they're dealing with, so it's a lower risk. Uh, oftentimes, it can be a way in which uh, uh, they can kind of test you as a supplier to them of how well you'll do by just giving you a, a, a smaller uh, order. If you do well, that increase it a little bit. And then in that process, you're establishing a relationship with them. So eventually you become uh, responding to uh, solicitation. Uh, it's uh, it's the, they're flexible and faster than uh, solicitation options. Again, if you looked into like in sam.gov and looked at solicitations, Oftentimes, you'll see that it's like 60, 100 pages long for something, whereas this, it's just basically give me a price, and um, if I like your price, we're, we're going to go ahead and buy it. <clears throat> uh, for sole source, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later, there's less documentation involved using uh, simplified acquisition or micro purchase than if it's actually a full solicitation. Uh, it helps the government agencies uh, contribute to their small business goals. So all government agencies have goals to do a certain percentage of business with small business, woman-owned, veteran-owned, 8A firms, et cetera. So by using these uh, contract vehicles, uh, it helps them to achieve those goals. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier with, uh, with this first bullet point is that it, it lowers the risk in establishing a new trusted supplier. So again, uh, they've never done business with your business before. So by making a smaller purchase and seeing how you do on it, uh, see how what kind of level of professionalism you have in that transaction, it enables them to kind of establish that relationship with you by starting with a small purchase and then growing that as it goes along. And then uh, as this last one here, uh, the, the federal government's fiscal year goes from October 1st through September 30th. 
uh, typically like when September rolls around and agencies still have budget money, they want to spend their budget. So make sure that they can then at least get the same budget, if not more in the next fiscal year. So uh, this is an easy way for the government buyer to, uh, you know, make some purchases at the end of the year without a whole bunch of work and documentation. Uh, so, <clears throat> so for you as a as a vendor, you know why 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 are simplified acquisitions and micro purchases good for you? Well, it's a rule of two. So, if the if it's a set aside, say for any one of these categories, small business, A A woman, etc., as long as the government gets at least two uh, bids or offers or quotes. And if it's less than 250,000, then uh, they'll just pick whoever was providing the, the smaller number. So it, ma it makes it, uh, again, easier for you to be awarded an opportunity. Uh, it's a great way for you. You know, one of the things when you start looking at solicitations is that typically in the solicitation, they're going to ask you to provide uh, three references of past performance that you've had and you know you can use private sector experience but ideally what they'd like to see is federal government experience but it's a great way for you to then uh, create some past performance by uh, some smaller purchases <laughs> um, it's an opportunity for reorders so again uh, once they uh, you fulfill an order for the government they know you, they like you. Uh, it may be the type of product that maybe it's kind of a commercial off the type, off the shelf type product or service. Uh, once they know you, then it's that opportunity for a reorder. They feel comfortable with you so they can go ahead and do that. Uh, it's also, again, an opportunity referral. So you're selling to one uh agency or department within an agency you know you could ask the person that you're working with hey is there somebody else in within your larger organization that we can do business with <clears throat> so and then uh, what's also really nice is if it's a again it's a small purchase a small whether it's a service or a product uh more than likely it's going to be paid for with a credit card. So there's no real uh, lengthy invoicing process or anything like that, you know, having to wait 30 days. And then, so again, it's, it's a fast payment. So it really helps your, your, your cash flow. <laughs> and then uh, again, it does lead to significantly higher uh, threshold options. So again, as you establish that relationship with them, Ideally, the goal is the purchases that uh, the government makes from you increase in dollar value. So, um, so what the government is like, when can they use? So basically, they can they can use use uh, simplified acquisitions market for anytime they're purchasing goods and services that are valued below the thresholds that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, However, you know, they first need to look at whether they have any kind of mandatory sources of supply. So an example given is Ability One. If you're not familiar with Ability One is their companies, often many of them are nonprofits, but uh, many of the Ability One companies, as an example, use uh, as employees people with disabilities that otherwise would have a hard time finding employment. So companies that are approved for the Ability One program, the government needs to look first to them for purchasing uh, various products or services for them first if there's Ability One company that sells those. Uh, existing IDIQs, you know, IDIQs means uh, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. So if, uh, as an example, the, say, uh, military base has an IDIQ for construction services with a company or various companies, uh, 
if there's a need for a small construction project, maybe there's been an accident and there needs to be some remodel work, the dollar value is going to be small. Maybe it's, you know, less than $10,000, like $5,000. They need to first look at those IDIQ contract holders first to do the work. Uh, it could be that those contract holders maybe are too busy to do it. Then they could go ahead and, uh, offer the contract to somebody else, but more than likely, you know, one of the IDIQ holders would do the job for them. And then just other established contracts. So there's other contracts that are are long term that the government has. So they need to come basically look look there first. <laughs> so here, here, here's just some, some facts about uh, federal government purchasing. Uh, I mentioned earlier how so many purchases are made kind of in the month of September, but like you see here, over 35% of the purchases made by the federal government happen in the last quarter. So that's the month of July, August, and September. So right now we're right uh, in the middle of it. You can see that uh, for small uh, simplified acquisitions and micro purchases that you can see that the dollar value is is really increasing uh, back in 2010 it was 7.5 billion that was bought using those methodologies and now in 2019 it went up to 18.4 and um, if i went out and did the research and had more recent figure like say from 2022 i'm sure that number uh is even greater now than 18.4 uh, billion dollars. Uh, this part is is uh, important to notice is that approximately 65% of purchases are not set aside. So what that really means is that when the government wants to buy something, uh, it might be a small purchases, nothing prohibits them from say going, say, say they want to buy a, a copier the copier breaks down, they need one. Uh, so they may then, they could go to like your local Staples, Office Max, et cetera, and actually buy that that way. So be, they would be buying it from a large company. So there's nothing, just because it's a simplified acquisition or micro purchases that forces them to only use small businesses or any of the other set aside categories. So keep that in mind. 75% of the time, uh, simplified acquisitions and micro purchases, they're not posted in SAM.gov. So we know that in SAM.gov, if you're looking for solicitations, basically contract opportunities, that's where you go to look for them. Uh, but 75% of the time, they're not there. 25%, uh, you'll see like a maybe sometimes a simplified acquisition that's posted in SAM. And so it might be something that it's like a $200,000, $150,000 uh, procurement of, of something. And so you'll see that, but uh, most of these uh, opportunities, you won't see them on SAM.gov. So if someone ever tells you that there's a place where you can go and see where uh, micro purchases or simplified acquisition procurements are posted, uh, it's, it's not true. It's not true. They're lying to you. Uh, and like this next bullet point, micro purchases are not advertised anywhere. You know, simplified acquisition, 25% of them, you'll see them on Sam, but micro purchases aren't advertised anywhere. And we'll talk a little bit more about since if they're not in, if they're not advertised anywhere, you know, how, how are you, how do you learn about them and those types of things so, and then with sole source awards, it's uh, really, again, small. It's 2.5% against all the small business programs. So it's the 8A, the veteran, women, small business, all those. It's, 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 it's really small. <laughs> so with that, you know, uh, why is there so few sole sourcing activity by the government? Well, uh, justification. Basically, uh, if a contracting officer wants to sole source something, they have to have a justification, a solid reason to say, we are only going to use this one company for this. 
uh, it creates uh, more documentation that they need to provide to show that justification. Uh, and once they go through that process of first determining that there's a justification, documenting the whole reason why of the, the justification, then they need to submit it for approval. So that process becomes complex. Once uh, a contract is executed during sole source, then there's a lot more oversight. So basically, it creates a, a lot of extra work for the contracting officer. So uh, as much as you might hear about sole sourcing and what a great uh contracting opportunity is it doesn't happen as often as people uh, might lead you to believe, basically because it creates a lot of extra work for the uh, procurement professionals. <laughs> so, so this is, this is, this is important. So uh, <laughs> again, uh, especially with the micro purchases that I said that, you know, they're not posted anywhere for you to see them. So, you know, how do you win a simplified acquisition or micro purchases? So uh, one of the ways you can do is, you know, identify buyers in SAM.gov and other resources. So if you go into SAM.gov, you can look at opportunities. And typically what it is, is that uh, contracting officers typically have like a specialty so like of an industry. So you'll have a contracting officer that basically all they do is buy construction services. And you'll have another one that maybe buys IT service, another one that buys uh, administrative professional service, those types of things. <laughs> uh, but when you look in SAM.gov, you're looking at larger opportunities, you'll see the names of those buyers and stuff like that there. So you can kind of then reach out to them. Uh, and uh, let them know that uh, you're you're out there, and so they can uh, just be aware. So when they do have a smaller purchase need, uh, they're already familiar with you. This next one is really important. It says have a complete SBA. DSBS stands for Dynamic Small Business Search Profile. When you register in SAM.gov, it automatically creates a DSBS profile for you. However, uh, the DSBS uh, database, there's a way you can get to your profile and add additional information where you can write as an example, like a four or five sentences kind of elevator speech about what your company does. There's a section where you can enter keywords that might make it easier for the government buyer to find you. And then there's a section where you can put in your past performance. So government buyers uh, use that database heavily when they're actually looking for someone, especially again, if it's a small purchase, you know, they're going to go in there and uh, they can, you know, search it, sort it by like actually down to like uh, counties if they're looking for something in specific. Uh, have a good capability statement. Uh, you heard me at the very beginning mention a capability statement. So as an example, if you identify a buyer in SAM.gov, uh, you can introduce yourself to them by sending them an email, attaching your capability statement so that they can get better uh, information about who you are and your capacity and the products and services that you sell. So, uh, you know, we can help you with capability statements. That's what we're here for. Uh, give you examples of good ones so that you can put one together. Uh, but it's a great tool. Uh, recently, within the past few weeks, uh, the SBA in that DSBS uh, database that they have have actually added a um, the ability for you to drop in a link there that would actually then by somebody clicking on that go to like to your website where they could see uh, a copy of your capability statement that again might give them a better uh, picture of your business and your capabilities. Um, this next one contact any stakeholders you can identify. So, you know, when you're um, you know, conducting business, you want to just kind of like this last one, basically network, network, network. 
you know, you need to let people know that you're in business and and share what it is that you sell, you know, the products, the services, uh, join associations, chambers, etc. Uh, if you join uh, like an association or a chamber, uh, don't think that just because you join all of a sudden, you know, your phone's going to start ringing off the hook as people want to buy from you. But, you know, you need to go on a regular basis. Uh, Try to talk to different people every time you go so that more people can know about the products and services that you sell. So that way, uh, when they have a need, they're contacting you. <laughs> so here's some additional key points on, uh, you know, weighing some of these uh, simplified acquisitions and micro purchases is referrals. Again, going back to the networking part of it. You know, you need to let people know that who you are, what it, you sell, uh, ask them for if for their business, if not their business, do they know anybody else that you could potentially uh, sell your product or service to? You know, everybody knows somebody else. So, uh, you know, establish trust. So as you are out there and you're meeting people or again, maybe you, uh, you do land your first small purchase, maybe for, you know, for a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars, uh, make sure that you're, you know, establishing trust with, with your customers so that they want to purchase from you again, you know, don't, uh, uh, don't over, over, oversell, uh, kind of like they say, you know, uh, under promise and over delivery, uh, capability, you know, make sure that, uh, the potential customer knows the capability of the products and services that you sell. So, uh, and also, uh, again, kind of goes back to the trust is that know what your capabilities are and don't try to uh, make yourself seem like you can deliver on something when you really can't. This next one, value proposition. Uh, people want to know why should I buy from you? You know, what is your value proposition? What is it about your product that, you know, helps, uh, helps uh, the customer out? Could be like a good value proposition might be for you that uh, kind of like the last bullet point on the bottom right there is urgency. Uh, the reason why the government maybe has contacted you is because uh, they know or want to see that, can you deliver, you know, within the next day or two, you know, we've got an emergency, you know, uh, say again, like our copy machine broke down, can you get over here to, to fix it or can uh, you, you know, bring us a new one, those types of things. So talk about what value proposition you have. A lot of times um, the, the products and services that are purchases purchased using like micro purchase in particular are the types of services and products that typically it's going to be driven by the lowest price is going to uh, win the contract. So uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, past performance, again, th that's key. Uh, nobody wants to be your first customer, whether it's in the private sector or the government sector but start thinking about that and having that handy so if somebody asks you you know who you sold to in the past uh be able to provide that information quickly to them again ideally if it's in the government marketplace maybe you're selling to uh the city and all of a sudden the county wants to know hey who else have you sold to you say oh well, i've sold to the city or the school district makes them feel more comfortable. So again, ideally, if the your past performance can be uh, other, another government entity, that's great. If it's not, more importantly, is if the product or service you provided to someone in the private sector kind of matches the product or service that the government is looking for. Uh, persistence, so be persistent, uh, but don't, uh, don't be a nuisance. <laughs> Uh, so again, uh, buyers are busy people. Uh, you want to make sure that they know that you're out there, the products or services that you sell. But uh, you know, don't be uh, upset if you send them an email and they don't get back to you or anything like that. Just you know, 
put it like on your tickler file every three months you just send them a nice polite hey just checking in to see if you need our product or service something will happen uh where all of a sudden they will need your product or service and they'll remember that you've been professional and just letting them know that you know you're you're out there ready to do business with them and again know your know your pricing so again typically especially with micro purchases the turnaround time is really important just like i was talking about the uh disaster recovery you know there's a reason why all of a sudden that uh upper threshold jumps from 250 250,000 to 750 because the how quickly you can provide those services is really uh the most important thing at that point <clears throat> So some other things about what does it take for success is that, uh, you know, registering government agency databases. So again, that's the first place that the government is going to look for a potential supplier. So again, you want to get registered in SAM, which helps create that uh, profile for you in the SBA's dynamic small business search. Uh, make sure that you go to the dynamics and we can teach you that it's not intuitive of how to how to add that information into your dynamic small business search profile reach out to us and and uh, we've got some documents and that we can share with you that I'd give you the instructions on how to access that <laughs> but same thing you know register with your with your county your city etc with the state because that's going to be the first place that the government buyer is going to look for potential suppliers is there. Uh, have effective and professional marketing materials. So uh, I should have their uh, capability statement as well, but, uh, but have business cards. So when you're out networking with people, you know, make sure that you have, you know, business cards and they look good. Uh, ideally, I think if you're going to be in business, you need to have a website and uh, you can get a pretty good website nowadays for literally like six, seven hundred bucks. You can get these templates online through GoDaddy or Wix, etc. There's others. <clears throat> uh, but. What you want people to do is basically they meet you, they like you, but they're going to want to look, go to your website and learn more about your business. So make make that easy for them. Also, I highly recommend that you have a website, but then your email matches your website. So if your website is abccompany.com, your email says victor at abc. Uh, dot com so that it matches you know i know a lot of people in order to you know save money have gmail accounts and yahoo accounts and stuff like that but uh you look a lot more professional if your email matches your website <laughs> again um it's a print the print could be again could be that capability statement that we can help you put together it's a nice way too that you can put a nice capability statement together so that you don't need to actually go out and uh you know necessarily hire a graphic designer and come up with some fancy brochures and stuff like that the capability statement will do that for you and then the value proposition you know i i mentioned that earlier uh but uh clearly identify what is your value proposition that uh you can articulate to a potential customer why do they want to pick you part of that you can ask somebody that you you sell you've sold to in the past a good customer and say hey why did you pick us and they'll tell you why they picked you so that can then help you identify what your value proposition is uh like i said earlier uh be persistent but you know be patient but persistent you know uh, again don't uh become unprofessional if you don't hear back from uh buyers but again be patient uh they'll need what it is you sell at some point 
or or not you know again it could be that uh you've done your market research and you you have found out that, that uh maybe what it is that you sell is something that they have to buy through like i mentioned earlier like ability one companies so uh then it's uh don't waste your time trying to sell to the federal government if they have to buy from ability one uh, then focus your efforts on maybe selling to the city, the counties, local school districts, the state that don't have those types of requirements. So uh, uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> Be web savvy. Uh, I always kind of say this with being web savvy, and it's because, uh, and actually I'm doing a presentation in two weeks about how to find government opportunities that I will walk you through various websites. but. Uh, not all government entities use the same terms for the same thing. So a good, some good examples are uh, the federal government calls a contract opportunity notice. They call it a solicitation. The state of California calls it an event. And then when you get down to like a county or city level they just might call it a contract opportunity or something like that so uh and again sometimes you have to like poke around on web websites to uh find the information you need when you're uh wanting to like say register in their in their vendor database etc and then also just realize that sometimes you think you've found exactly what you're looking for and you click on a web page and then all of a sudden you get an error message that said, this page is no longer there anymore. So uh, just be web savvy. <laughs> and this last one is just really important. You know, you need to accept government credit cards. And all that means is, is that uh, you just need to be able to uh, accept credit cards. Uh, that's, again, uh, the government actually have individuals that ha they call it a warrant that basically is the dollar limit that they can purchase anything for so somebody might have a warrant up to ten thousand somebody might have a warrant up to a hundred thousand and others have warrants that up into the millions but uh the government uh some of these individuals you know will make like a two hundred thousand dollar purchase and pay for it with a credit card so uh make sure that uh if what it is that you sell might fall into a category of micro purchases, simplified acquisitions that you have the ability to take credit card as a payment. And again, by doing that, you get your money a lot faster than if you're having to go through a regular invoicing process. <laughs> so what not to do? Talking about what to do. And now let's just a few things here on what not to do. So shotgun approach. Uh, you probably get emails like I do where basically no one's really even done the homework and they've sent out uh, an email to hundreds of companies and uh, like the ones I get is it's obvious that they don't even really know who we are and what we do, but they're trying to sell me something. So make sure that, you know, you identify a company, do a little market research, understand that they buy what it is you sell. You might need to con try to contact them and said, hey, uh, do you buy what I sell or uh, do you buy in smaller quantities and those types of things? It could be that, yes, they buy what you sell, but they may buy it in very large quantities that you may or may not be able to uh, deliver. Uh, not dedicate enough resources and basically what that means is that uh you need to make sure that if you're going to kind of get into the government marketplace that you're going to know that you realize that you're going to have to you know pay somebody or yourself to spend some time doing some market research to figure out who who's buying what again maybe registering your company with these various websites those types of things so, I mean, you're expending resources while you're doing that. So make sure that you realize that, that you're going to have to put in some effort. You're not going to get the fruits of your labor right away, but it'll eventually start happening for you. But uh, if you don't commit enough resources to that, uh, you quickly can get discouraged and say, well, this isn't going to work. 
and um, just abandon selling to the government. <laughs> this next one again is poor, no website. So again, take a, if you don't have a website, take a look at some of those uh, templates that are available. They've got some really nice, all kinds of, like I said, templates that make it pretty easy. You don't have to be a webmaster or no HTML language or anything like that to actually come to put together a pretty decent website. If you can afford it, you know, it might help to pay somebody a few thousand dollars to put one together for you. Uh, but if you do, what I always suggest is, you know, use tools like uh, like a like a platform like WordPress where uh, they can help lay it out as an example. But then you can go in without having to go back to the webmaster who you're paying money to to actually update information in the website, like changing the prices or adding new products or services that you offer, et cetera. Uh, lack of preparation for outreach events. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, you need to be out and about networking. Uh, but oftentimes I've seen that people show up to various networking events, outreach events, and they're not prepared. You know, they don't have business cards. They didn't show up with any kind of like a capability statement or brochures on their company. Uh, they uh, are asked by maybe somebody at a booth, hey, tell me about your company. And they don't have a uh, rehearsed elevator spe speech <laughs> explaining uh, briefly exactly what it is that your company does. So make sure uh, that you kind of start thinking about those kinds of things so that you're prepared when you go to events. Uh, poor collateral materials. Uh, I don't need to really kind of go into that. And then again, just unprofessional behavior. So again, uh, I've seen too often that uh, people just take offense too quickly when you know a buyer doesn't respond to them, etc. You know, buyers again are really busy people. And so they may not respond to you right away or if or ever for that matter. Uh, and it could just be that they're just very busy. But again, you want to send them a capability statement that shows them that, you know, you are maybe a little bit more uh, savvy, more professional than somebody else. And they'll file it and they'll keep it handy if they like what they see. But uh, uh, again, just... Uh, be professional when you're dealing with people that are potential customers. So with that, <laughs> I can take any questions you might have, but here's our uh, next webinars. I'm sure to kind of tie into what I was just talking about, but how to find government contract opportunities in two weeks is again, I'm going to take you to like sam.gov and kind of show you where they post their opportunities there, uh, what to look for when you're looking at them. And then likewise with the state of California's e-procure website and then a county and a city to so kind of show you uh, the similarities and differences and how, how they're used. And then um, on August 30th, do one on events, you know, how, what to do before, during, and after, you know, how to, how to prepare for events, especially if they're big ones. Uh, I was just in San Diego last week, a very large Navy event, the Gold Coast Navy event. And, you know, it cost, I think it was $700 for you just to attend. <laughs> and uh, that's just to attend the event. I mean, but if you think of travel and hotel and all that stuff, uh, it can be pretty expensive. So you really want to take time preparing yourself for events properly. So we kind of will cover all that in that webinar. <laughs> so with that, uh, if anyone has any questions, just drop them in the chat there and I'll uh, answer your questions or in the QA, either one. Um, here is my contact information. So if you feel more like <laughs> contacting me directly with your question, you can do that too. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you will get a copy of this presentation. And then, uh, oh, the email is wrong there too. Uh, the, uh, you get a copy of the presentation and then a, 
a link to actually the recording of the presentation as well. If you want to uh, listen to all this one more time. <laughs> well, I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll let you go. And then I hope we see you in two weeks where again, uh, kind of show you how to find government opportunities online. So thank you very much for joining us. And then we'll see you. Oops, here's a one question. Oh, just a comment. All right. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, let me let me just make let people go. Uh, go. But uh, Jared and Jordan, would you please stay in on our presentation that I just like to chat with you about something. We got six people on. So that's four. Okay. Uh, let's stop the share.